but I have not heard any actual ideas on how to fix anything or apparent interest in making things better. Because if they wanted to, then they would be voting for capping the cost of insulin or helping the baby formula shortage, which is a problem they cause themselves with their own policies, right? Yep. So the good of the American people doesn't seem to be on their radar. The blame of the Democratic Party does. Hello, and welcome to the Politics Girl podcast. I'm your host, Lee McGowan. Let's get into it. Today's pod is a candid conversation with Bharat Ramamurti, the Deputy Director of the White House National Economic Council, a graduate of Harvard and Yale. Bharat previously served as a member of the Congressional Oversight Commission for the CARES Act, the first coronavirus relief bill, and as the Managing Director of the Corporate Power Program at the Roosevelt Institute. He was the top economic advisor on Senator Elizabeth Warren's 2020 presidential campaign and served as senior counsel for banking and economic policy in her Senate office. I'm having Bharat on to join me today to talk about inflation and the economy, because no matter how far down an authoritarian rabbit hole we go with the Republicans, no matter how many rights they take away or things that we count on, like crossing state lines or social security that they promise to get rid of, we are still stuck acting like the worst thing in the country right now is inflation. So let's talk about it. So without further ado, please welcome my guest, lawyer, political advisor, and White House financial expert, Bharat Ramamurti. Welcome, Bharat. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you for joining me. I feel like we're sitting at such a weird time. And for once, I'm not talking about rising fascism or the complete abandonment of women's autonomy over our own bodies. I'm talking about the economy. And um, some days I'm reading things like the Biden administration added 6.4 million jobs last year, which is the most in any year in history. And that seems really good. And then our dollar is stronger than ever, par with the euro, which seems good. I mean, is that good? I mean, it's good if you're traveling to Europe, but maybe not so good if you want to export things to Europe. Um, gas prices are still obscenely high, but they've gone down for the last 35 days straight. So we're clearly on the right track. But then you read that last month's inflation was up 9.1% from the year before with prices rising faster than they ever have in 40 years. And you're like, oh, maybe we're on the wrong track. So Bottom line, I think no matter what the statistics and the economics really are, I think the American people are working with the knowledge that prices are higher than ever and wages are not. So things are just costing more and that makes people feel stressed. And we hear from the Republicans who have no plan of their own to fix it. You know, inflation is bad. Biden is bad. Democrats are bad. And I think most of us just kind of feel lost. Like whose fault is it and what's going on? So do you want to try and break it down in maybe maybe not the speak of White House Economic Council, but in a way that maybe regular people could understand? Yeah, sure. I'm happy to try. Marvelous. So you're right. There's a lot of good news in the economy right now. If you take a step back, especially if you look at where we were when President Biden took office about 18 months ago, right? we've gained almost 10 million new jobs during that period. The unemployment rate was above 6% when the president took office. It's now 3.6%, which is by historical standards, extraordinarily low. Yeah. Uh, so people have jobs. Uh, we, we also see a lot of data that these tend to be good jobs, better jobs than they may have had before. A lot of people are taking advantage of uh, what's, what we call a very tight labor market, which is employers really out there looking for people to work for them, uh, to, to bargain for better wages, to trade in a job that they may not like so much for a better job that pays them better. All of that is really good, and we like to see that. Wages are also going up, especially for uh, folks at the lower end of the income spectrum, people who haven't had a raise in a really long time, people who work in leisure and hospitality, for example, their wages are up more than 10% uh, over the last year or so. All of that is really good news. That is set against the fact that we have a set of global problems, starting with inflation, right? The United States obviously has been dealing with very high inflation, but we're not the only ones. The United Kingdom, Canada, uh, across Europe, Japan, all of these countries are dealing with, in many cases, 30 or 40 year highs on inflation. Yeah. And that demonstrates that the cause of that inflation is not something that President Biden did or something that happened in the United States. It's a global problem. Right. Uh, what are those problems? Number one, uh, COVID is still an issue. The fact that parts of China will lock down, which means that manufacturing capacity in those towns uh, ceases to function. That messes up our supply chains globally. That ends up raising prices because there's less supply of goods. And then most uh, notably was Putin's invasion of Ukraine, yeah. which sent uh, energy prices and food prices through the roof uh, globally. 
So the way I look at it is that we have this set of global problems which are real and that are hurting families and we get that. But because of the president's economic response starting last year, the United States is uniquely well positioned to deal with those problems, right? A lot of other countries are dealing with all of this high inflation, but they have higher unemployment or wages have been uh, stagnant or they're, they're at 0% economic growth. We were at 6% economic growth last year. So uh, we are able to take on these challenges from a position of strength. Um, that's a credit to the president's economic plan. Uh, I know that for families that are paying more at the pump or more at the grocery store, it's doesn't make them make them feel a whole heck of a lot better to say, well, somebody in the UK has it even harder. Uh, but that's the truth. Yeah. Um, and I think it's going to position us well over the next few months as some of these issues start to resolve. And as you said, gas prices have been coming down, most notably over the last uh, month or so. It's going to position us to get to a place where we have strong economic growth, low unemployment, um, and lower prices or a declining inflation, which is going to make things a lot more comfortable for families. Well, I'm sure people would love to hear that because everyone wants to feel a lot more comfortable. I mean, I think people forget that we basically got here because we were slammed by COVID-19, right? The Trump administration, the Republicans spent a long time trying to pretend it wasn't happening or it would just go away. And then we we started this crisis functioning from a reactionary spot rather than a proactive spot. So if people forget, you know, by the spring of 2020, the U.S. economy was in near collapse, right? When the lockdowns went into effect, almost overnight, our economy just shut down um, and people weren't buying things. They weren't going out. They We lost 22 million jobs in that first year, right? It was the economic output was at lowest it's ever been. And the Democratic House put forward massive government spending, right? I think you were on that bill, the CARE Act, right? That you were on the Oversight Commission for. Um, yeah. And that was eventually taken up by the Republicans, but it lingered for a long time before anyone pretty much noticed it. But obviously this clear lack of action was going to hurt them in the election. So they did finally move it along. And then along with the Fed and a bunch of emergency moves, like credit to Donald Trump for Operation Warp Speed, which is pretty much the only thing I can give him credit for because he had no plan to roll that out, right? It was the Biden administration that took the vaccines and really rolled them out so seamlessly to people. So we could get the economy moving again. And I think people forget because it was such a chaotic time for everybody. So instead of sinking into what everyone expected to be this economic downturn, the economy actually rallied. And people have to remember that that was not expected, right? It bounced back better than anyone could have expected. And then the businesses were scrambling to keep up with demand, right? They couldn't hire people fast enough or buy enough, enough exports or the supply lines were cut off because of the pandemic. And so that's where the inflation basically came from. And I think we kind of forget because it seems like so long ago, March, 2020, that's like so long ago. But as you said, you know, this isn't an American problem, right? This is a worldwide problem. Like 9% inflation is terrible, but like you said, it's around the same as the UK, as Italy, Mexico, Spain, right? But everyone from Australia to Russia is experiencing inflation. And like you said, some of them have 0% growth, right? It's New Zealand is the highest it's been in 32 years and Joe Biden isn't president there. so. I think people need to remember that it's so easy to blame the government. Well, obviously these people are in charge, so this is why it's bad, right? But I think we have to remember that the American government doesn't control the world. We're important, but we don't control the world. Who does control the world? Who functions globally? Whose decisions do affect worldwide markets and economies? And I think we could be honest and say that's probably giant corporations, right? You know, anyone paying attention can see that corporate giants right now are raking in massive profits, like record shattering profits. I did an understanding inflation podcast a couple of months back, just the basics. And one of the things I was talking about was Procter and Gamble raised prices on staple items like diapers and toilet paper. And they were saying it was because of the pandemic. But when those price increases went into effect, Procter and Gamble reported an almost 25% increase in profit, right? So that's not inflation. That's raising your prices, knowing people will blame inflation and not you. And that's capitalism and that's corporate greed, right? So what do you think we should do about this kind of corporate greed? Because people are really pointing it out now, right? And there's a lot of people even used to work for Elizabeth Warren, a lot of people that have a lot of ideas. So what do you think we should be doing? Because I don't think it's so much a government problem as a corporate greed problem. Yeah, look, there, there, there's a lot of complexity in all of this that I think is worth unpacking first. Yeah. Um, you're right that every price increase isn't uh, a naturally occurring fact like gravity. It is a decision by a corporation to raise prices. Yeah. 
And there can be any number of reasons why a corporation decides to raise prices. Obviously, corporations, in some cases, have a legal obligation to be maximizing the returns for shareholders, maximizing profits. And so they're going to look for every opportunity uh, to do that. Uh, you know, People say, is that corporate greed? I, I would just say uh, there's nothing uh, negative about that in the sense that uh, the corporations themselves would tell you that it's greedy. They just call it profit maximization instead of greed. So in some cases, what we have is uh, corporations during the pandemic in 2020 making short-term business decisions that have ended up reverberating uh, years down the line. So to give you an example, um, car companies in 2020 were concerned that we're going to be in this prolonged recession because of COVID. We're, there's not going to be as much demand for cars. And so one thing we can do to, to save on costs in the short term is order less semiconductors, less chips that go into our cars because people are going to want fewer cars. So they did that. And then demand bounced back very quickly because in part of the, uh, the economic agenda of the president, people wanted to buy cars. Well, what happened? These car companies didn't have enough chips right. to make cars to satisfy that new demand. And that meant that there was fewer cars for more people wanting cars. And that meant that the price of cars went up. So is that greed? Is that um, a certain amount of short-term thinking, saving money on, on semiconductor purchases, right. coming back to bite those companies, which end up hurting American consumers? It's some mixture of all of those things. But there's clearly a corporate role in all of this. Uh, that happened with oil refineries with two. Oil refineries took refining capacity offline in 2020 because demand for oil and gas went down. People weren't driving anywhere. People weren't flying less. And then all of a sudden, when demand bounces back, you can't just you know flip the switch at the fact at, at the refinery and turn it back on. They also had to recoup profits <laughs> that they exactly. lost. So, so that's a big part of it. And, and yes, what we have seen, I think that there's certainly some evidence that when you have rising prices across the board, uh, a profit maximizing corporation looks at that and says, now is a good chance to get in that price increase. Because if people are paying more for groceries and they're paying more for gas, maybe they won't mind paying more for diapers or paying more for uh, stationery or a printer or whatever the case may be. Oh, they'll um, mind, but they might not blame them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> The other, the other factor here is uh, and something that I've been working on is uh, a lack of competition. So there are industries that are highly consolidated, which means that there are very few big companies that control most of the business. And what we've seen is that in some of those industries, the price increases have been higher uh, and the profit margins have been higher, right? So a lot of corporations will say, well, our, our own costs are going up. And what we're doing is passing along those cost increases to our customers in the form of higher prices. Mm -hmm. But... If you look in the data, what you can see is that their margins, which is the difference between their costs and the price, uh, has been going up. So we see that in the meat processing space. That shows up in part in higher prices for beef and uh, at the grocery store. Uh, we, we see that in the ocean shipping industry. You know, all that stuff that comes from Asia, a lot of it comes on uh, big ocean carriers. And that's a highly concentrated industry. In some cases, the prices that they charge to ship goods from Asia to the United States went up 10 times, 1,000%. Um, and of course, if the t-shirt company is paying 10 times to ship its goods uh, to the United States, it's going to pass some of that along to, to customers. So you've got a lot of things in the mix here. Um, fundamentally, uh, I think COVID had a, big, had a big part of it. I think that companies... Um, didn't expect our economy to bounce back as quickly as it did, in part because after 2008, it took a long time for our economy to bounce back. Yeah. Whereas I think because of the strong response from President Biden and congressional Democrats this time around, um, our economy bounced back much more quickly. And, uh, and companies were, un are, were, were unprepared for that. And as a result, we're having some of these mismatches that we're seeing that are resulting in higher prices. So the, the key is uh, different industries, different Markets are going to have different problems, and we have to tackle them uh, not with a one-size-fits-all strategy, but with targeted solutions. So we passed a, a historic reform of the ocean shipping industry, uh, responsive to the concerns uh, that I raised about prices going up uh, tenfold. You know, we are we are working on providing more competition in the meat processing space. We're putting a lot of money out there to support new smaller meat processors to compete with the big guys and provide more competition and more options for farmers who are trying to sell their stuff. 
Um, whereas in other spaces, they, they cracking down on price gouging that makes sense. Mm. So we're, we're sort of doing all of the above strategy. And I think that makes sense because we're facing different problems in different sectors. Right. And so is that the job of the Economic Council in general to like look at all the different industries and say like this one might need a law to like watch for price gouging and this one might need a law to like limit the taxes on this and this one might need a law to like get more. I know you guys were doing a thing where it's like at the shipping yards, you can pile them four high instead of two high. And that that seems like not a big deal, but it does when you want to move goods faster. Those kind yeah. of decisions. So that's what you guys are doing at the National Economic exactly. Council? You know, we, we proposed, the president proposed during the State of the Union, a reform of the ocean shipping industry. Right. Um, and within a few months, Congress passed with broad bipartisan support, uh, a reform just about a month ago. Uh, we had an issue in trucking, right? We have all these goods coming into the United States. Sometimes they're piling up at the ports. They're not getting out to where people need them. That's in part because there weren't enough truck drivers to move them from the ports to different parts of the United States. There's a reason for that. Uh, truck driving wasn't as that appealing of a job. You know, these trucking companies made people uh, wait for hours to load their trucks, and they wouldn't pay them for that time. So we worked with the trucking industry to make these more appealing jobs. And we've seen an increase in people working in the industry, which means good things for those truckers. It also means good things for Americans who can get their goods more quickly and more cheaply. So we've been doing this sort of sector by sector analysis and weighing in with what we think is the appropriate response. A lot of this is going on under the radar, but it's Yeah, definitely it's it's going on under the radar. I mean, these sound like really great ideas that people should know about. I mean, if I was sitting around listening to the Republicans, you guys are doing nothing and everything is your fault. And, you know, the problem is the Federal Reserve because, or the problem is we gave people stimulus checks, which was two years ago. And the last one was $600. And that's not inflation. (laughs) That's just people spending money on food and housing. Um, Why do you think they say that? Like, why do you think we're blaming the Federal Reserve? Isn't our one big move for inflation to raise interest rates? Isn't that the Fed's whole job to monitor inflation? And the Fed has been raising interest rates pretty aggressively, which appears to be working. But why are people blaming the Fed and the federal government for this when clearly you guys are taking a lot of steps to try and mitigate this? For the Republicans, I I don't want to try to speak for them. But I I could. I think that it is... (laughs) It is a very simple message to say uh, Biden and the Democrats spent a lot of money and that's why there's inflation. Right. And I think as I've been trying to explain, and as you've been trying to explain, it's a a much more complicated story. Um, And we've been doing the hard work of trying to actually diagnose and address the problems that exist. Right. The fact that we passed the American Rescue Plan and sent out checks and provided tax cuts to folks in March of 2021 uh, isn't the reason why uh, Italy and South Korea and Japan have record high inflation along with the United States in July of 2022, right? This is a global problem and drawing a line between those two things uh, doesn't make very much sense. And and again, in fact, I would argue the opposite, which is that if we had it passed the rescue plan last March, um, we would still be dealing with record high inflation in the United States, just like every other country. But we'd be dealing with much higher unemployment, much worse growth, lower wages, And a lot of families dealing with evictions, bankruptcy, foreclosures, stuff that we've by and large been able to avoid during this recession that were very present during the last recession and previous recessions in in American history. So we averted a lot of pain and suffering with the American Rescue Plan. Um, Again, I I think that uh, folks who want to blame the federal government for that, that's a a simple message. It obviously docks into the larger Republican critique of quote unquote big government. But the truth of the matter is, um, government stepped up this time, and it really helped a lot of people. Yeah, with the things like you couldn't evict people from their homes during the pandemic. You know, your student loan was put on hold during the pandemic. These kind of things were very important to protect people in a time where they wouldn't have been protected. And like you said, they would have ended up with more unemployment, more homelessness, this kind of thing. That it's not perfect or where we want it to be, but certainly the government took a big picture look at it and- 9% is probably a lot better than it could have been. And also with a growth rate on top of it. So we have a way to get out of this. We might be in a hole, but we're in a hole we can climb out of. We have put steps in to get out of it. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. And look, the the, the example I always use for people is uh, at its peak, the price of gas in the United States at the pump went up about almost $2 between the end of last year um, and, you know, a few weeks ago. Right which coincides with when Putin began threatening Ukraine and we saw the global price of oil go up. 
Now, do we think that that $2 increase in the price of gas is because we sent out checks in March of 2022, or sorry, March of 2021? Or do we think it's because a dictator uh, with large uh, oil experts uh, ended up threatening another country, which affected the global supply of oil, right? And, and I think that same thing with food, with wheat. A lot of commodity prices have gone uh, through the roof because both Russia and Ukraine are important uh, exporters of commodities. Yeah, people forget that. All the farming that happens there. I think, you know, for folks who uh, are, are looking uh, to pin the blame uh, on inflation on the government response, uh, I think that the data just isn't there to support uh, any significant role for what, the, uh, what we did. And I think instead, the data so shows that uh, we really averted a lot of pain and suffering and that we provided uh, the U.S. with a unique, uniquely strong position to respond to these global challenges. Um, and I'm glad that we did it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And even if you buy into the idea that the whole problem is the government, right? Um, every time Democrats have put forward a solution to try and help problems, right? Like the bill you guys put forward uh, for the baby formula shortage or financially protecting veterans who were struggling or capping the cost of insulin or putting forward a bill so oil and gas companies couldn't gouge people at the pumps, the Republicans voted against it. So every time you said, here's a solution to the problem you're complaining about, they were like, yeah, we don't want to vote for that. Because yeah. ultimately... It doesn't serve them. In a two-party system, making you guys look bad only means they get back in power, right? So they can complain all they want, and they do. But I have not heard any actual ideas on how to fix anything or apparent interest in making things better. Because if they wanted to, then they would be voting for capping the cost of insulin or helping the baby formula shortage, which is a problem they cause themselves with their own policies, right? Yep. So the good of the American people doesn't seem to be on their radar. The blame of the Democratic Party does. Yeah, I mean, look, if you look at what uh, the Republican agenda is, as far as I can tell, it's this one document that Senator Rick Scott put out. <laughs> yeah, it's a great, hell of a document. Hell of a document, bro. <laughs> and here are, the, here are the main ideas in that document. Number one, every five years, Medicare and Social Security uh, will be put out of service unless Congress votes to reauthorize them. So significant uncertainty for people who rely on Medicare. Every five years. And we know how much they love to take us right up to the... Yeah. edge every time. The second thing he proposed was that uh, people who don't pay taxes today should have to pay some taxes. Now, who is that? Seniors on fixed income, uh, people who are between jobs, uh, people in poverty. Uh, Senator Scott thinks that they should pay taxes. That's one of his big economic agenda. And third, of course, since we're talking about a Republican agenda, cutting taxes for rich people. So that's the Republican agenda. Meanwhile, they are steadfastly opposed to some of the things that we have done to cut costs for people in the short term. So let me give you an example. For years, people have been talking about bringing down the cost of prescription drugs. You know, right. People in the United States pay two or three times what people in other countries pay for the exact same drug. And part of the reason is that we have the Medicare program. It is prohibited by law from negotiating with the drug companies to lower the cost that it pays for prescription drugs, which then allows us to then provide it to seniors and others for cheaper. Well, we are on the verge of being able to do for the first time, getting rid of that prohibition and allowing Medicare to negotiate the cost of really important drugs, which is going to save hundreds of billions of dollars for taxpayers, for seniors, cut costs for families who can't go without, of course, their prescription drugs. Uh, every single Republican is lined up to oppose that while they go on TV and talk about inflation all day and all night. Uh, so you're right. I think it's really important to get past the rhetoric and look at what are people actually trying to do to address what we all agree is a problem? We have a plan to deal with the problem. We think it's responsive to the actual causes of the problem. And we're out there working hard every day to make sure that we're delivering as much of that as we can to the American people. And Republicans uh, will vote against all of that during the day and then go on TV at night and talk about how the Democrats have no solutions. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's easy to say that a thousand dollars, you know, two years ago or some 50 cent raise for workers is the reason that we have inflation. But ultimately, that's not the case. And if you're not voting to make anything better for anybody, then you have really very little right to complain. Growing up, my dad used to say, if you don't vote, you can't complain. Um, but also, if you vote against everything that would help, you also shouldn't complain. I must say, Rick Scott's 11 point plan for the Republicans is alarming. And I wish more people would read it. Now, speaking of economics, we have to take a quick break to thank the sponsors who made this show possible. So we'll be right back after this with Bharat Ramamurti. So if you listen to this podcast, you know what a big fan I am of Athletic Greens. 
I have my family on it, my friends on it. I tell everyone about it because it's really that good of a product. It's an easy once a day lifestyle change that makes the biggest difference to your overall health. And it doesn't matter how you eat, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, gluten-free, Athletic Greens will fit into your lifestyle. Tons of people take some kind of multivitamin, but it's important to choose one with a high quality ingredient that your body can actually absorb. Athletic Greens was created when the founder himself was experiencing a ton of health issues and ended up on a complicated supplement regime that was costing him around $100 a day. So he created Athletic Greens, which includes 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens that would cost less than $3 a day. Athletic Greens has over 7,000 five-star reviews and is recommended by professional athletes, leading health experts, and melty podcasters like me. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with a convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop in a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you one free year of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash politicsgirl. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash politics girl to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate in daily nutritional insurance. So our first order of Splendid Spoon arrived when I was here in Toronto and my husband was alone in Los Angeles. My husband is a very good cook, but he's also a very overworked person. So this box of prepared food arriving on his doorstep when he had no time to cook for himself was a real godsend. All of a sudden, here were smoothies and power shots and juices and prepared meals, and all he had to do was heat them up. I told you the first time I talked about Splendid Spoon that we weren't sure if it was going to be right for our family because we're not vegetarians and it's a plant-based meal program. But Splendid Spoon was like, nope, you're going to love it, and they weren't wrong. Sean not only said it was delicious, but it was packed so beautifully. He thought, okay, I'm going to empty this little Tupperware container into the pan, and it's all going to be mushed together like, like I had it for leftovers. Except that's not how it arrived. Splendid Spoon has packed these meals up so beautifully that each layer of the food is separated, so it's not all wet and goopy. It's really thought through. It's like you put the things into the pan as you chop them yourself. Well, the onions are over here, and the noodles are over here, and it's all not all mixed together yet. It's incredibly clever. Every single meal is 100% plant-based, gluten-free, GMO-free, but even my meat-eating, barbecue-grilling, gluten-loving husband really enjoyed it. He said he liked coming home and being able to just have a smoothie or a power shot in the fridge as a snack. Honestly, I can't wait to get home and try it for myself. So stay well and feel healthy this summer with Splendid Spoon. Get started today and save on an entire week of ready-made plant-based meals. Just go to splendidspoon.com slash politicsgirl for $50 off your first box when you subscribe. That's $50 off at splendidspoon.com slash politicsgirl. Summer can be stressful for parents. Either you've got too much planned or not enough planned to keep your kids busy. Those not going to school hours can really stretch out. So if you are looking for fun, ready to go activities that you can feel good about, that's perfect to fill in those gaps during the summer days, look no further than Little Passports. You wanna keep them off screens? Little Passports. You wanna keep them busy on a plane? Little Passports. Rainy day? Little Passports. Little Passports offers globally inspired award-winning kits filled with hands-on activities, games, and stories, all designed to spark curiosity and imagination among young adventurers and scientists. Each month, Little Passports will send you a kit packed with play-based activities, interactive crafts, puzzles, games, and stories to help children have fun while they learn about the world around them. For listeners of the show, Little Passports is offering new customers 50% off your first month with any subscription when you go to littlepassports.com slash politicsgirl and use the promo code politicsgirl at checkout. That's 50% off your first month of any subscription when you go to littlepassports.com slash politicsgirl and use politicsgirl at checkout. We did Little Passports for years when my son was young, and I can't recommend it enough. It's just a super quality product that makes a great addition to your child's activities and a great present for children you love. littlepassports.com slash politicsgirl. I'd love to return to your idea of there clearly not being enough competition in America, right? That we have too many monopolies, that we have um, too many um, industries like meat that are down to say four companies that really make all of it, that kind of thing. Um, And when you have fewer and fewer companies, that kind of monopolization means you have fewer and fewer places to go for those goods and less companies to sell them to you, right? So you can raise their prices if they want and we, the consumer are stuck, right? You were talking about the price of meat. You know, people will be like, oh, did you see the price of meat? And I'm like, I have, it's awful, but 
there's four companies. They all got together and we're like, you guys want to raise your prices? Like, let's do it. And there's no way to stop that as a consumer, right? Ultimately, they make higher profits and it's a good deal for them because then they can do stock buybacks or they can um, benefit the CEO pay, which has gone up extraordinarily in in, um, America. And so when you look at stuff like that, it's clearly the workers aren't sharing in these windfall profits, right? Because it's not the workers at these corporations that are making record-breaking money. It's the corporations themselves. What do you think we should do about something like that? Because it feels like you work for the Biden administration. You guys are doing the best you can to deal with the issues as they come along. But long-term, you used to work for the Elizabeth Warren campaign when she ran for president. So you obviously like her economic approach somewhat if you worked for her campaign. And Warren herself is pretty clear that giant corporations don't pay their workers enough to keep up with inflation. They pay little to nothing in taxes. They are price gouging their consumers and they're constantly jacking up their own CEO pays. Like I think, what are the CEO pays? The Amazon CEO, what did he make? $212.7 million last year, (laughs) which is like over $6,000 more than his average work, 6,000 times over his average worker, right? The CEO of Expedia made $296 million last year, right? So this average CEO pay is extraordinary. I think the average for Fortune 500 companies is 18 million. And then some of them go up to $300 million a year, where when you account for inflation, workers went up like 2.3%, right? So it seems extraordinary. And it feels like something the corporations are not going to police themselves. And we're going to have to do something. So what do you think we should do? Big picture thinking, you know, there's, there's lots of people that have ideas, but what are, what are some of yours? Yeah, look, I think that you've got to do a bunch of different things. The first thing is um, there's there's a lot that we can do to promote competition. I think over the last 20 or 30 years, there's been less uh, what, what we would call enforcement on the antitrust side, right? Mm-hmm. So if can you explain antitrust to people? Sure. So uh, so we have a set of laws dating back about 100 years that say that uh, big firms can't engage in anti-competitive conduct. So part of that is obviously direct collusion, like you like you referenced. You have two firms getting together and saying. I'll raise my price five bucks and you raise your price five bucks. And that way we both make money. Yeah. Um, but there's, there's other things. And we, we believe that um, it, it is, it is better for the economy, a more dynamic economy. If firms are, are exposed to competition with one another yeah. and at a certain point firms get so big and they control so much of the market that they can quickly snap up other you know, nascent competitors um, and crowd out anybody else. And at the, and at the end of the day, that's going to end up hurting Consumers. So, you know, the, the example was AT&T, right, back at several decades ago that um, controlled most of the phone service in the United States. And, and, and the United States government uh, started an antitrust action against them to essentially break them up and say that you've got to be able to compete with each other because otherwise one big company controlling all the phone service in the United States means that people are going to end up paying more. But what we've seen over the last 30 years is that um, in 75% of industries, there has been growing cons- concentration meaning the biggest companies control a greater percentage of the market in those industries. And so uh, what we can do is, you know, take a very critical eye to mergers, right? Make, really make sure, are these going to end up benefiting workers, consumers? Is it going to benefit the competitive dynamics in that marketplace? And if not, we can reject them. And is that, is that happening? Are you yeah. rejecting mergers? One of the things that the president did about a year ago was issue a, a historic executive order on competition, saying, um, basically, I want to go back to the way it was with the Roosevelt's. You know, both Teddy Roosevelt and FDR really put a lot of emphasis on robust enforcement of antitrust laws, robust scrutiny of mergers, making sure that these things are going to end up being in the best interests of American consumers. And he's put in place really strong enforcement folks at the Department of Justice and at the Federal Trade Commission to, to do, the, do these investigations, bring enforcement actions, uh, scrutinize these mergers. And we're already starting to see uh, progress on that front. Already a handful of mergers that would have been harmful to American consumers have been blocked and withdrawn by companies because of the scrutiny uh, from the Biden administration. We're, we're happy to see that. We think it's a win uh, for American consumers. Oh, absolutely. I, I just want to raise one more thing, which is, and the president talks about this a lot. You know, it used to be the case that not, not ancient history, you know, 20, 30 years ago, uh, American corporations believed that they had an obligation, not just to their shareholders, but to their workers, to the communities that they operated in, to the suppliers that they worked with. 
Um, and there's this revolution in the 80s where it became the corporate purpose to maximize shareholder value. That was it, to the exclusion of everything else. And what we have seen since then, since the 80s, is a huge shift in how corporations use the money that they earn. It used to be that about half of it was reinvested into the corporation, research and development, providing better pay for their workers. Now, more than 90% of it gets sent back to shareholders in the form of stock buybacks and dividends. And so uh, that shift, uh, I think, has had a, a significant impact on the wages that American workers get paid. Um, it has, in my view, contributed to some of the inequality that we've seen, because when we talk about returning money to shareholders, it's important to remember that uh, 85% of the shares in this country are held by the top 10% of households. Yeah. Um, and so when the stock market goes up, when money is returned to shareholders, that's not equally spread across the American population. It's really going to a relatively narrow slice at the top. 50% of American households own no shares whatsoever. So um, trying to get some reforms to the way that corporations operate and the legal obligations that they have, that's something that the president has been focused on and something that we're working with Congress to try to do as well. Oh, that's marvelous. Because honestly, the other party would do the exact opposite. Um, they are definitely a corporate company line guys, and they would make sure you could maximize profits to the detriment of the American people. I mean, I think it's interesting that you're talking about the 80s because before the Reagan administration, companies weren't allowed to engage in stock buybacks. You know, it artificially upped the value of their companies in the market. And like you said, most people aren't involved in the market. What do you think about returning to a thing where companies can't do stock buybacks? Yeah, there's been proposals in the Senate uh, and the House to do that. Um, as you said, it was actually originally the Securities and Exchange Commission in the 19, I think it was 1982, uh, changed their rules. Before then, as you said, it was considered illegal market manipulation. Which it is. run by its own stock. That 1980 rule, to, rule changed it. The SEC uh, is in the process of reviewing whether that rule makes sense. Now, um, whether that means they withdraw it or they, they tweak it and say that in certain circumstances it's not permitted, Obviously, that's going to be up to the SEC. It's an independent agency. But that process is underway. I think, for me at least, the buybacks are a, uh, a symptom, but are not the underlying problem. Okay. Right? The underlying problem, in my view, is this shift in what corporations believe their purpose is from uh, you know, broadly benefiting the communities that they operate in and the, their workers and so on to maximizing shareholder value. You know, if you clamp down on stock buybacks, for example, it's possible that they will just do dividends instead of stock buybacks, right? And other ways of returning money uh, to shareholders. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing that's very silly about our current system is that the tax treatment is different whether you do a dividend or a stock buyback. It's actually better uh, for stockholders and for the company to do a stock buyback than a dividend because they're taxed at different rates on that. One of the things that we've proposed and actually passed the House of Representatives this year um, is a 1% tax on buybacks. So that would equalize the treatment between okay. buybacks and dividends. So um, not all the way to banning buybacks, but at least making sure that if you're going to do a buyback, it's not tax preferred to other ways of returning money to shareholders. Right. And then what is your thought on something like that Robert um, Reich has suggested, you know, this windfall profit tax for people that have made just bank um, while the rest of us were out of work, big, big companies, you know, oil and gas companies, these kind of companies that have made ridiculous profits or people like uh, Bezos and um, Elon who have completely quadrupled their money. What do you think about a windfall profit tax? That's another suggestion people have to kind yeah. of balance out the system. Yeah, I think that there's uh, merit to a lot of those proposals. One thing that you always have to be aware of when you're talking about a windfall profits tax is let's take uh, oil and gas, for example. Okay. Part of the issue now is that the global supply of oil has been disrupted by Putin's invasion of Ukraine. And part of what will help bring gas prices down is making sure that there's no more, more oil and gas supply available. Yeah. What you want to do is if you're going to consider something like a windfall profits tax, you probably want to design it in a way so that it didn't um, create an incentive for companies to produce less, if that makes sense, because that would exacerbate, that would sort of be cutting off your nose to spite your face. But there are lots of ways of designing uh, potential taxes that could get around that problem. And I think all of them are worthy of consideration. And in fact, the president has made clear that he is considering them. 
that's great. It's nice to know you guys are open-minded to stuff like that, because I think there are a lot of people just think, well, why don't, why aren't there price ceilings for certain essential items? You know, like, why don't we have price control? So we can't be gouged for diapers or baby formula or whatever. Um, and like you just said, we're going to have, you're working, how close is it? This pharmaceutical bill where we see, you know, we can cap certain pharmaceuticals because that would really help people. Yeah. No, I think we're, we're, we're measuring that in weeks, maybe oh. even days, right? So, so people should look out for that. What is it yeah, called our, that we should look out for? Our hope is that, you know, by mid-August, that something like that will be uh, on the president's desk. Marvelous. So pass through the House and pass through the Senate. You have the votes yeah. in the Senate. Exactly. Marvelous. Now, I know recently the U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen met with financial officers uh, at the G20 to come to an idea about having a global corporate minimum tax rate. But we just saw Joe Manchin saying he doesn't support this proposal, which was kind of tied into a climate change spending bill because he doesn't want to include higher taxes for corporations and wealthy Americans. As usual, his opposition will probably hold up the entire bill. But the problem is, is that Yellen has said she still wants to move forward with it, whether that's a executive order or whatever, because she says that it's truly important global initiative that all these other countries have agreed to. And it doesn't make any sense for America not to do it because, say, a U.S. company is being taxed 15 percent in Germany, but America is going to leave that 15 percent on the table and not tax them here. That feels like a mistake. That feels like a dumb move for America. Where are you uh, guys on the minimum corporate tax rate and what Janet Yellen has been organizing? Yeah. No, this is a huge priority for us. And I, I just want to take a second to explain why. So we have this, we have this system now where uh, a multinational corporation, the bits of the very biggest corporations that operate in multiple countries, uh, it's very easy for them to uh, effectively move around the earnings that they make and place them in subsidiaries in different countries that have really low tax rates. Like Apple hanging out in, where are they? Ireland or Ireland, Scotland? Right. right, or the Cayman Islands. Right. right? And, and as a result, some of these big corporations pay, in some cases, zero, but in, in many cases, very, very low taxes. And so not only does that deprive the American government of revenue, it means that these corporations that benefit from U.S. investment in our workforce, U.S. investment in our legal system, and all the things that help make these, co these companies make money, and they're not paying for their, their share of that. But it's also wildly uh, uh, problematic for small businesses, right? So if you're um, a small retailer, right, a small shop on Main Street trying to compete with a, a big multinational corporation, well, you know, you don't have a subsidiary in the Cayman Islands. You can't move your, your earnings there, and you're paying full freight on your taxes like a good corporate citizen, <laughs> meanwhile, your competitor is paying way less than you. So how is that fair for that company? So uh, it's a real big priority of ours to try and get this done. Um, the easiest, a key part of that is passing something through the Congress that reflects this global agreement that basically says all these countries agree that we're going to uh, levy these types of taxes. And you know, this is, it's a type of thing where um, you need cooperation across the board because of a bunch of countries say we're going to do these taxes and some of them don't. And all that happens is that all of the action flows to those countries that are not abiding by it. So right. it was a big deal to get 130, I think it was, countries to sign on to this. As Secretary Yellen says, a lot of this can happen, uh, can keep moving forward, even as the United States is trying to get its tax on the books. Other countries can go ahead and impose its tax. Um, and we're supportive of those efforts. And we're not giving up by any means on trying to get this thing through uh, Congress. Uh, we actually think that there's very broad support for it among the Democratic caucus. Um, and uh, and if we can't get it done this year, we'll keep fighting for it next year. It's really, really important. It's, it's not only going to bring in hundreds of billions of dollars of worth of revenue, which can go to, you know, pick your thing. Child Paid family leave. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any of those things. Expanded childhood tax credits, you know, like right. that kind of, yep. But like I said, I think it's a really big issue for small businesses because, I, you know, the number of small businesses I talk to that say, you know, how do you expect me to compete with the big box store down the road if they're basically paying, you know, one tenth of the taxes, the rate tax rate that I am? Uh, I think that that's a really, really compelling. And I think for, for an administration that is really focused on small businesses and, and providing a platform for them to succeed in the United States, this is a big part of that agenda. 
And I think that's what people need to remember when they go voting in the midterms, you know, like, yes, Joe Manchin is holding it up now, but so is every single Republican, right? Because they're supporting corporations. But if we get more senators, more Democratic senators that are willing to move this along, we can get things like a minimum corporate tax rate that will allow small businesses to compete and also bring in dollars for all the other things we want. We could bring back, build back better. We could add those things back in if we had more senators to bypass the votes that never come with us, maybe get rid of the filibuster and actually pass it the way the government was supposed to work on a you know a majority basis, and and get the things done so people can see the government can really work. That the government, all these things you've been saying that the government's been doing for us that we don't even know that we're not registering yeah. because quite frankly the Republicans are better messengers and they're really good at driving home blame without offering any solutions of their own, right? Yeah. And I think it doesn't help that the media is so desperate to appear non-biased that they look for any reason to kind of rag on you guys and the Biden and the Democrats to just blast out the negative coverage so that it looks like they're balanced with the Republicans. But it's not journalism to play both sides, right? It's journalism to report the truth. And the truth is the Republicans have gone down some weird anti-democratic rabbit hole where they want to take away Social Security and Medicare and, you know, tax the poor and give tax breaks to the rich. And you have to say that you don't need to balance that out with trying to find something on the Democratic side. That's just the truth. Right. So they need to report the truth so we can see all the things you guys are doing and engage us to come out and vote to get more Democrats to do more of these things. I think that's yeah. so essential. Um, yeah. And negate people like Manchin who keep holding up the show and maybe we could, could get our climate bill. Um, I really want to thank you for joining me today, Brad. Um, it's a really complicated topic, but I know it's an incredibly important one. And I want to thank you for sharing your expertise. If you had one last thing to leave us with before you go, what would it be? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on. This has been a great conversation. I think that, um, uh, look, I, there, are, there are so many things that this president wants to get done for the country. Uh, and economically, and we haven't been able to get all of them done. And that's true for every president. But I want to underscore that we really have gotten a lot of it done. And um, uh, whether it's the rescue plan, which I, like I said, has really um, provided a foundation for strong economic growth. And, and by the way, the most equitable recovery that we've had from a recession in the history of this country. Um, to, the, to the infrastructure bill, which we haven't had a chance to talk about, but so hundreds great, of millions though. of dollars. It's so exciting. It's so exciting. I have to get Pete on to talk about it. Yeah. But, you know, look, yeah, a big deal for me, uh, every single lead pipe in this country, which is, you know, carrying water that was potentially harming the health of our kids, every single lead pipe in this country is going to be ripped out and removed and replaced because of the funding in that bill. You know, we're going to build a half a million EV chargers across the country so that you can drive your EV from coast to coast and always have a place to get a charge. All of these things are somewhat under the radar, but they're really important and we're pushing the country in a better direction because of it. Um, and like you said, with an even more favorable Congress next time around, there's even more that we can do, but I am also proud of what we've been able to accomplish so far. Absolutely. I think people don't realize, even you're, you're talking about the infrastructure bill, we've talked about infrastructure for 40 years and got nothing accomplished. I mean, the country is literally crumbling and not only the recovery bill, but then the infrastructure bill. If Joe Biden did nothing else, he has accomplished more than a lot of presidents have accomplished in, in eight years. So this is impressive. But what we have to do is keep pushing us forward. We have all these plans. We need to give them the votes to get these plans accomplished. I think that's yeah. essential and what people need to keep their minds on. Like, even if they just say, you know, higher global corporate tax rate, like I'm getting them, you know, those corporations, I'm getting my vote to have that happen. So that's a good leave behind. Thank you. And keep up the good work. Those of us who are paying attention can see what you guys are doing over there. And we will keep reaching out to make sure other people can see it as well. Thank you so much. So that was Bharat Ramamurti, Deputy Director of the White House National Economic Council, talking to us about inflation, the economy, and all the things the Biden administration is doing under the radar, while the Republicans blame them for all the country's woes. We have to remember, as painful as inflation is, managed well, it's short term. And because of the recovery package, we're actually feeling less pain than we could be. Now, that doesn't make you feel any better as you pay $12 for strawberries or $6 for a gallon of gas, but we aren't alone. The whole world is dealing with inflation and Joe Biden is only the president of the United States. And the United States is negotiating a bill to lower prescription drug prices that you should see next month. The United States has agreed to join 140 other countries to implement a minimum corporate tax rate. 
The National Economic Council, where Bharat works, is looking at every industry individually to see where we can make policy that will benefit the American people. And we need to give them the tools they need to get these policies passed. The midterm elections are coming up and one party plans to get rid of Social Security and raise taxes on the poor. And one party wants corporations to pay their fair share and cut childhood poverty in half again. Even without this party wants to strip you of your rights and this party wants to give you rights, it's a pretty clear choice. So let's make it happen. I'd like to thank Barat for joining me today and you for caring enough about democracy to be here. Now go out and make the world a better place. Until next week, PG out. The Politics Girl podcast is written and performed by me, Lee McGowan, in partnership with the Midas Media Network and produced and edited by Happy Warrior Entertainment. All rights reserved.